Okay, we'll be finishing up uh, the, the chapter of uh, Psalm 89. Uh, we've had three messages from the, the uh, chapter already. We've talked about the mercies of the Lord, how that the Lord is building up a house for us. Uh, he's building up a place for us in the heavens. Uh, it is through his covenant of mercy. Uh, this covenant is uh, the Old and New Testament, if you will, uh, being fulfilled through there. The promises of the Old and New Testament uh, being fulfilled through those. Uh, his covenant of mercy transitions uh, both of those testaments and the promises started uh, in uh, even before the foundation of the world. And so we talked about that in the first book, about how that, uh, uh, how that David desired to build a tabernacle for the Lord on the earth, uh, but instead, uh, even though he was a bloody man, even though he was a man of war, and he was not allowed to build a physical tabernacle, and, and uh, Solomon was able to do that, uh, God gave him a promise that he, through him, through the tabernacle of David, if you will, uh, through David's house, uh, spiritual house, is that David wanted to build a physical house for the Lord, and, but the Lord says, no, I'm going to build you a spiritual house, and through your descendant, which was Christ, uh, I will build up this house of mercy. I will build up this covenant of mercy, and those who are all in the house will have eternal life. And this promise, this covenant that I have with you, is not one that has a time period on it, but rather it's from eternity past to eternity future. It's building up, and that's the purpose of our life here on this earth, is to build up this house, uh, build up this house through us. And this covenant of, of promise, we, we saw that in uh, chapter 1, uh, was the, the uh, house of mercy, that covenant of mercy through the tabernacle of David. And then the second message we talked about was how that this covenant was eternal as in the heavens, uh, that it was uh, that God, in fact, not only promised it and that it would be eternal, but that he had the power to fulfill it. Uh, and so we talked about that in the second message. In the third message, we saw, we saw how that uh, Ethan, uh, the prophet, was given this vision of God uh, and the anointed, the Holy One, which, you know, of course, they're both God, uh, the Father and the Son, uh, speaking together that they were laid help on one that is mighty, and that one that was mighty was David. They took him out of the sheepfold. They took a, a servant, a, a humble man who had the heart of the Lord. Uh, you see, it was after the heart that he was able to become this picture, and it is after the heart that man is saved and, and receives this covenant. Of course, we talked about that, how to receive that covenant, and how that David was a picture of the coming of Christ, according to uh, 2 Samuel chapter, uh, I believe it was 7, uh, is that we talked about this passage and, the, and uh, that, how that, he, uh, that his descendant, which was Christ, would come from him, uh, from his seed, uh, and that he would be a picture of the Holy One. He would be a picture of that one that would be there. But until he came, which was a thousand years uh, before Christ actually ever came, uh, they would give them a picture of, of David, uh, of the kingdom uh, of Israel, as a picture of the heavenly kingdom. The physical David, the physical king, uh, the first the true king of, of uh, Israel's kingdom, uh, and that physical kingdom of Israel was supposed to be a picture of the heavenly kingdom or the heavenly Christ. Uh, it is not a transition from the physical into the spiritual, but rather it has always been a picture of what was always in the heavenlies. Uh, there, was, there is no replacement or transition, but rather the picture uh, is, uh, is supposed to picture that in the heavens. And of course, now we have the earnest of the, our inheritance. We have uh, the actual picture it's fulfilled, the body of Christ itself, uh, that was supposed to be uh, this picture of the Old Testament is now fulfilled in the New Testament picture of Christ. Uh, Christ has come down on earth. God has prepared a body for his Christ uh, that came and died on the cross, fulfilled this, and has gone into heaven to prepare a place for us, to prepare that spiritual house for us. Uh, because he has built the house physically, uh, spiritually on this earth through his believers, through David's tabernacle, but that one day this... Uh, House, the spiritual house that is on the earth through David uh, and now through Christ, see, uh, it will be in the heavenlies, uh, in high places with the Lord, and that spiritual house will be built in the heavens, and one day the spiritual, which is New Jerusalem, will come down and be one with the physical. Uh, and so that the, the two will become one uh, on the earth, and then, of course, uh, entering into the millennial reign of Christ. And, and so that physical house that he's building for us will come down and uh, God will be with mankind. 
And so we had that picture of David was the third message. Now the fourth message is we're taking us to the present, if you will. Uh, the present of Ethan's time, the present of our time. Uh, the time of Ethan, uh, he had the picture of David. We have, of course, now the uh, earnest of our inheritance, the picture of Christ. Uh, and we have uh, that spiritual kingdom, uh, the, the Lord's church, and, and so forth, uh, whereas they had the physical kingdom of Israel. And, and so we have the same pictures of this uh, covenant of mercy. We have the same pictures of this house of mercy that the Lord is building up in the heavens for us, uh, yet there is always this present sense that it's not being fulfilled. Even though we have uh, the covenant of mercy, we have the uh, we have the eternals in, in the heavens being a picture of its e e eternal covenant. Uh, we have the picture of David. Now we, of course, we have the picture of Christ, uh, of the surety of this covenant, the earnest of our inheritance. And yet this third message, the fourth message we're going to talk about is how we feel. Now uh, what the promises are and what the sureties are and how we feel at times is oftentimes very, very different. Uh, and so we're going to deal with uh, our interactions, how we feel uh, at the present moment. Uh, and, and so that's always, that's always different than the promises, right? You know, it's like uh, when, when a little child has, uh, has a promise from the father, his father, that, hey, you know, when I come back home after a long day's work, after earning, your, uh, earning my paycheck so that I can take care of you, uh, I'm going to take you out for some ice cream. And, and so that little child, uh, while he's waiting for that promise, you know, he's, he's had ice cream before, he knows what it is, uh, and so forth, and, and then he's waiting for that parent, but then there's no ice cream to be had, he's, you know, school's over, uh, there's nothing to do, uh, he's done all his chores, he's done all his homework, and, it, you know, the, the, uh, the neighbor next door is being a bully to him, and he's, and he's taunting him, he's being mean to him, and he just can't wait for his dad to get back, but there's no dad around. Uh, dad's not home. Uh, it feels like uh, the promises are gone. feels like uh, the protection of his father is gone. And, and what's going on here? What, what, why, can't, uh, why can't I ever uh, have a good day, if you will? Uh, and, and so that's kind of the, the similar situation is that, uh, is that we are in that predicament, uh, except it's a bit more heavier on us because it's a bit more real, uh, you know, when it, as parents, we understand and realize that, uh, that that's only a temporary situation. We'll be home eventually. The bully next door isn't going to hurt you. Uh, he's, just a, he's just a bully, uh, and eventually I'll be home, and, and I'll take care of you. Uh, but, you know, just a, the time in, in place, it feels difficult, uh, but it'll be over with. And, and in that similar way, we have a, a situation with the Lord, in the promises He has given to us, because He is long in coming, we feel as if. Uh, and so we're going to deal with that section. Let's go ahead and start by reading the psalm again. Uh, even though this is the fourth, fourth message, we're going to go ahead and read it again. Uh, it is Psalm 89, Mishael of Ethan the Ezraite. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. The, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Salah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea when the waves thereof rise. Thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. For the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance, and 
thy name shall they rejoice all the day long. In thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horns shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou speakest in a vision to thy Holy One, and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall, be, shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. For my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with them, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seat also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn my, in, by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, as a faithful witness in heaven. But thou hast cast, salam, but thou hast cast off and abhorred, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. Thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant, Thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all of his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. All that pass by the way spoil him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast also turned the edge of the sword, and hast not made him to stand in the battle. Thou hast made his glory to cease, and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth hast thou shortened, thou hast covered him with shame. Salah. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is, wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Salah. Lord, where are thy former loving kindnesses which thou swearest unto David in thy truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servants, how I do bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people. Wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the opportunity to consider uh, what you have for us in this chapter, and thank you for the uh, messages that we have already considered before that... Uh, that uh, you are building a place for us through, uh, throughout all of eternity, and that's your mission, uh, is to build this uh, spiritual house for us and, and for a place for, for us to dwell because you're, you're before your throne so that we can be able to stand before you and because without this house we could not, could not stand before you. And Lord, I thank you for the, uh, the, the truth and mercy you sent through Christ to, to build this place for us so that we can uh, dwell with you uh, and, and to, to be with you, Lord. I pray that you'll help us to uh, have faith in you as, as we're going through this process realizing the, uh, the bre brevity of our life and realizing the brevity of the things that we have and, and the situations and the feelings that we have uh, that, uh, that uh, you, while you are doing these things throughout eternity that we, have, we only get a small glimpse of them Lord, I pray you'll help us uh, to be encouraged through the promises be encouraged through what has happened and what you say will happen Lord, I pray that you'll give us faith as we as we uh, live for you in this uh, in this oftentimes cruel world and oftentimes difficult situations, and Lord, special, give us faith, give us strength, and Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. It says, it says, once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever. His throne, as the sun before me, shall be established forever as the moon, as faithful witness in heaven, uh, faithful witness in heaven. So a lot, 
and, and so we see the surety of this in, in three messages and three sections of this. We have talked about how this covenant is forevermore. I mean, in every section, it, it's about evermore. It's about evermore. It's about how it cannot be lost and how that God has the power uh, to do all these things. And, and he has the ability. And, and the proofs of that is in the pictures that he's given to us through, through David and also through Christ and, and through the kingdoms that, uh, that have been set up through the kingdom of Israel and through the kingdom of heaven, and so forth, that people are entering into. Uh, and the, the surety is there. However, when we see it through our limited range, or limited view, uh, we oftentimes cannot see the whole giant picture. Or, or even if we do know the whole battle plan, if you will, uh, we are only stuck in our one little foxhole. Uh, and so, uh, even though if the, the battle or the war is being won, oftentimes it looks from our vantage point, that the battle is, is horrible. I mean, there's bombs bursting in the air and everything's all around us and, and, and we can't survive and, and, and um, if we stick our head out, it might get blown off and, and we're like, why is this happening? Why, why aren't we winning the war? Uh, I, I know that we got the best plan, we got the best army, we got the best equipment, but it seems like everything is just not going our way. Uh, the enemy seems too powerful for us. And even though uh, in, in the middle of the battle it seems like we're going to lose, uh, the, the, if everybody sticks to the battle plan, it will eventually work out. Uh, and, and so uh, even though we have that faithfulness, have that understanding, we've read the back, uh, end of the book, we know the end of the story, we know how that God is, has built, been building this up to a certain point, and he's doing things in history uh, that may not at times look like uh, they are winning strategies, but looking back on the strategies that he has done up to this point, we see that every single one has been for a purpose and for a reason, and so we rest in those promises and so forth. But here in this passage, uh, it ends with uh, the faithful witness in heaven, and then Salah, to think about those, to think about those promises, uh, to dwell upon those things that we've been promised have been shown. However, the promises and the facts and the logic and the reason are oftentimes not... Uh, they're, they're, we always want a little bit more, right? We want to have confidence through the whole situation. It's kind of like uh, uh, wanting to be able to know uh, that for us, what about us? You know, obviously we see the big picture. Uh, we see how everything works together. We see how that the Lord will do these things. We see how that the Lord will, in fact, raise us up again. Uh, but what about us as an individual? What about me in this whole situation? Uh, when I see things from my vantage point, again, book three is about, uh, is about interacting with the world around us, receiving understanding. Remember uh, the, the beginning of the book uh, where, where he's, uh, he's weary, his feet has well nigh slipped, uh, he's not sure where he's going, uh, he, he hears the promises, but he doesn't see them out in the world, and he feels like, hey, you know, this isn't worth living, uh, it's, I don't see any of the benefits of these promises, I don't see any of this in my life. But then he goes to church and he receives understanding and he receives the end. He sees the end of the wicked and those that go that direction that he, he wants to give up and go their direction because they seem to be having uh, the best life now in their life. And so oftentimes that's the biggest problem with Christians is not that they don't have the promises, not that they don't know what God is doing, but rather... They want something now. It's kind of like where Balaam, Balaam, he's looking over the children of Israel, and he says, oh, if I were only like you in the resurrection, and, 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 and I can see Christ coming, and, and these are far off, but not now, and all these things. And so you can see his longing, Balaam's longing for those promises he knew would be coming, but yet, what about the here and now? What, what about my life and comfort now? And, and, and so that's the difficult reconciliation that we oftentimes have with these promises. These promises are long in coming. These promises are far off. These promises are, are in the deep past. And these promises seem to be in the deep future. What about us now? I have to take care of me now. Why does it look like I don't have any of these promises? Why don't I get any of these fulfillments? Where is the witness? In fact, Israel as a, as a kingdom, as, as a godly people, they're no more presently. So how, how is that supposed to be a witness to me that it's eternal? You know, what about that covenant of Israel? What about David and his kingdom? I don't see David's kingdom here on this earth. I don't see David's kingdom 
uh, hanging out here. If it was temporary, then maybe these promises are not for me anymore. And so that was that's the situation, that's the feeling that he has. Oftentimes, uh, the present situation, Ethan's present situation, he's going to talk about, uh, and it looks very much like our present situation. And, and, and it's always quite interesting how that uh, this happening 3,000 years ago feels like our situation. And yet we can look on the past 3,000 years and look at all the events that had happened to build this kingdom and, and to build God's heavenly place for us, and yet his situation looks like our situation. How can that be? How can it be that, that we, uh, 3,000 years later, seem to be in the same predicament as he is? It's because the predicaments through every person's life oftentimes, except for very few. I mean, I believe, uh, I should have looked up this, this verse previously, but basically uh, that uh, Christ said that there are, many th there are many people, there are many prophets, there are many people that, that God had to speak about these things that desired to see the things that they saw, like Capernaum saw, and, and, and desired to see the ministry of Christ and the life of Christ. Desired to see them, but never saw them. Uh, there are many people that desired to see miracles in their life, but never saw them. Uh, there are many children in Israel uh, that desired to see these great things, but, only, uh, but God only worked in other people's lives and not in, uh, in their life. Uh, and, and so, even though the Bible records many wonderful works, these works happened over many years and only to a few people. Uh, and, and so, uh, in a few situations, so oftentimes we're like, what about us as an individual? I don't ever get to see these things. Uh, it, it says here, and of course it says, of course, he'll be established forever as the moon, as the faithful witness in heaven. Uh, but thou hast cast off and abhorred. Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. Uh, here, here's the situation. We see that Christ, you know, has been set on the heavenly places. Uh, he has established his church. He has uh, uh, put through, uh, we, we see in the book of Acts and through the letters, uh, the ministry of his saints, uh, the, the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Peter and and. Uh, and Paul specifically, and, and through their stories, understanding that the other apostles had the same situations, the same actions, and, and Philip, and, and, uh, and John, and, and all these different apostles, they have all been building churches and building kingdoms, and we look at and see in Paul's life how the God protected him, and that he was able to do all these wonderful things, and then... And we see how that the church is building up, and the church is building up, and, and Christians are being uh, are going around throughout the kingdom. But then we hear stories about Nero uh, destroying everything. We hear stories about uh, about the Roman Empire trying to infiltrate and take over the Christian church, trying to institutionalize it as a state uh, branch of the state government, uh, and so forth, and, and, and persecuting throughout all that time uh, faithful Christians. We see. Uh, how that uh, the Muslim empire has grown and, and, and infiltrated and, and taken over and, and the Catholic cult and, and the uh, Muslim religion of, of death and evil and murder has taken over many of the places where Christians had great fruit very early on. And then we say, what happened? You know, isn't the gospel ministry, isn't the, isn't the gospel that we proclaim life and liberty for all those who hear it, uh, and yet the Muslim empire seems to have taken over much of the Middle East. The, uh, the Catholic uh, groups have taken over the rest. And, and uh, where are your faithful people? Where are your promises? Where, are, uh, where is your power? Where is your greatness? Where is your uh, kingdom set upon this earth? And, and, uh, and we see seem as if God has cast it off and has aboard uh, his faithful uh, and and uh, we oftentimes see it and, and think, oh, well, Lord, uh, how come it's just this small remnant? I thought the church was supposed to be this great thing, this great thing where everything would build up and build up and build up and eventually uh, come. In fact, uh, in the, uh, I believe it was the 18 or 1900s, the idea, the, the prevailing philosophy and idea was that we'd be this great kingdom that would be marching on and that we would win the world for Christ and yet here comes World War I, World War II uh, that destroys that illusion uh, uh, that, uh, that we would build up this kingdom for Christ and that Christ would come and take it from us and that we'd be ushered in great glory. That was the prevailing idea. All millennium would say, hey, you know, uh, we would transition, uh, we would win this world for Christ and eventually transition to 
uh, to uh, the kingdom of God. And yet, here comes this great giant world war uh, in the midst of supposedly the most religious and most righteous, most Christian Protestant nations uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they start fighting in, in war and battle and, and, and physical things. And, and, and Germany and, and, uh, and, and Poland and, and England and all these different places are supposed to be the bastions of Christian faith. Uh, and yet, here comes along, uh, here comes along uh, the, the people to, to, to fight and kill and to maim and, and, and to uh, bring in evil. His, uh, it says, thou hast, uh, thou hast cast off and abhorred. It's like as if, as if he didn't want what the churches were trying to give to them. He didn't, uh, he didn't honor it. He didn't uh, set up that kingdom. He cast it down. He keeps on uh, changing the system. Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. Uh, all these faithful martyrs and all these things, and of course we see uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, people sawn asunder, uh, people uh, enduring affliction, uh, people going through great hardships. And where is the Lord's faithfulness to these people? Uh, why isn't God being faithful to His faithful? Uh, what? How come they have to be sawn asunder? How come all these prophets that got into Israel after... After David's time, we're killed. Uh, how come that Christ, when he comes, uh, and he condemns these people for killing all the prophets, and that their temples could be desolate and all these things, they kill all the prophets, and then they kill Christ. And, and we're, we're seeing these things. It's like, why are you casting off Christ, God? Why are you casting off your, your anointed? Why are you casting off and, and, and marring him and, and uh, allowing your people uh, to kill Christ? Uh, how come that when the uh, children of Israel came back into the land and, and they're building this nation and then the, uh, the priest takes it over? And you think, man, Israel now is being ruled by the, by the Levitical priests in the, in the Maccabees time and that this Christ is coming in and here's this great wonderful religious kingdom, uh, the light of the whole world. And, and Jesus even says that the salvation is of the Jews and, and, and this wonderful kingdom has come along and yet they kill Christ. You've cast off, you've aboard your anointed. It, it looks like, as if from the outside in, this great religious uh, nation, the, the most religious nation on this earth, the most Christian nation on earth, if you will, uh, has cast off the Lord's anointed. Why is that? What's going on? He says, he says Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed, thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. Here are all they serving, and and yet, and yet, we don't see the power. We don't see the establishment. We don't see, uh, we don't see the uh, basically the, the the faithfulness as as we would envision it. Thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. All the Jewish people, the whole Jewish nation, they rejected Christ. I mean, obviously, yes, the the early church was Jewish, and and uh, there are many great numbers of Jews that were believers, and, and many Pharisees. And, and so forth, they all became believers, but the leadership, the, the direction of the nation, uh, the uh, King Herod's, uh, uh, the Roman Empire, they all rejected Christ, the leadership all rejected Christ, and they, they refused to hand over the kingdoms, their kingdoms, if you will, to the Lord, and it seems as if their persecution has, has destroyed the establishment, the, uh, the, the throne, where is the throne of, of David, where is the throne of this, and you see, uh, rather than establishing Israel and rather than establishing uh, the Jewish people, uh, 70 AD, he cast them away, if you will. He dispersed them. He, he, he sent them away. And, and there's no more, uh, in a physical viewpoint, there's no more uh, covenant. There's no more promise to them. There's no more throne of David. I thought David's throne was supposed to be physically there for us as, a, as, as the stars, as the heavens, as as all these things, so we see the conflict of these things going on. We see uh, that this covenant of mercy is supposed to be as faithful as the stars in the heaven and the sun and the moon, and, and, and the throne is supposed to be established uh, forever, uh, and yet there's no throne of David in Israel. I mean, yeah, there's, a, there's an Israel now after 2,000 years, but it's, but it's a secular Israel. It's, a, it's an Israel that even the religious have still rejected Christ. What's going on? Thou hast cast off and aboard, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed. Thou hast been wroth with thine anointed, thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. 
Uh, thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. And, and so we see with, with, uh, with Israel and, and so forth that they've been cast down. They've been uh, broken down. That uh, David's throne, if you will, is not occupied, uh, it seems as if. Thou hast profaned the crown, cast into the ground. Thou hast broken down all the hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. Of course, remember the previous chapters we talked about how that there was a great vine that the Lord had built, and yet it was destroyed. The hedges were broken down, and all those things. And the picture of Israel being this great vine, and yet there was only one branch left where God's hand was upon it. And so this is the this is the situation where we're coming with is that it seems like the things that God has built has all been destroyed. He's allowed uh, the wicked to come in and destroy these things. And yet there's this one branch. And yet there's this one remnant. And, yet the, and so from our vantage point, we see the big, the big uh, promise and, and say, oh yeah, this big giant hedge has been torn down and this uh, big giant vine has been destroyed and, and, and uh, all hope is gone. And yet while we're looking at the whole big thing that's been destroyed, we forget that there's still something over here. And, and, and that's, that's oftentimes... Uh, the problem with Ethan, and that's uh, the problem with uh, with Asaph, is where they their feet are well nigh slipped because they see all this greatness that that used to be there, and yet it's not there for them. Uh, and, and and we see the great times of yesteryear where it seems like oh yeah people were left and right receiving the gospel. You know, man, in the 1950s we had that we had that uh, nuclear family and everybody uh, there was no word of divorce and everybody was seeing kumbaya and, and everybody loved one another and there was peace on earth and, and, and goodwill toward men and, and we had the Christmas, you know, it was the, the, the year of the, the jolly fat Santa, uh, the Coca-Cola guy, uh, you know, drinking his Coca-Cola and giving out presents to everybody on, on 35th Street and, and everybody has these black and white uh, movies of idyllic uh, future, and then we move on to the 60s. Oh, what was us? Uh, uh, we as Christians, you know, we're, we're growing free love movement, all these different things. And of course, uh, we, we have this idyllic rose colored glasses of the past, of this yesteryear, where we were greater and more powerful and more wonderful, and, and the hedges were all built up and everything was wonderful. And, and, and we forget that it took great effort to get to that point. And that those points are always, you know, every generation you have to work in there. And in fact, I've looked at, you know, of course, uh, uh, preachers of yesteryear. I, I've seen, uh, I've, I've read commentaries of people in the 1900s, and 1800s, and even 1700s, and 1600s, uh, these times where we think, oh yeah, that was so wonderful then, and everybody's hearing the gospel, everybody's preaching, and yet I open up the commentaries and say, this guy says, we have a blight of drunkenness. We, this guy over here says, we have a blight of of people running around on their wives. We have a blight of mistresses. We have a blight of this. And, and in all the situations is that every single commentator, uh, their life situation that they ministered in, that we think this is wonderful, idyllic future uh, or past, and, and that it was greater than we had, is that they had the same problems. They had the same issues. They had the same struggles. Uh, and yet we, looking back, see their great victories, but we forget where they had to go to get those victories. Uh, we want everything on a silver platter. We want everything uh, to give to us uh, with great ease, but we forget that it takes great effort to build this, uh, build this covenant on this earth and, and, and to give it and to preach it to others and to have this respect. And, and we need to look at it not as if, you know, the great past and the great future, uh, but we also need to see it as the great present. But oftentimes we... we for we oftentimes have these great promises in the, uh, of the past and the future, the great victories of the past and the great future victories, and yet we forget to apply them for ourselves. And this is the problem with Asaph, was, was that he had, he'd seen the promises, and he knew of where they were going, but he saw the great prosperity, the wicked in his time, and he felt he was well nigh slipped, and, and that he wasn't getting anything, and that he himself, uh, and, and so that's where we are. Is that we are? Uh, we feel like everything in our time is broken down. Is not as good as it was before. All passed by the way and spoiled him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. So they saw, of course, this idealistic future of David supposed to be this a kingdom. He he defeated all his enemies, but then it, but then when he defeats all of his enemies, he has rest round about him. 
But then his son Absalom rises up and tries to take over the kingdom. He has to flee from the kingdom. Where are your loving kindnesses, Lord? I thought this kingdom was supposed to be established forever. You know, in David's time, we see the greatness of David's time, and yet Absalom, in David's time, made it appear as if this kingdom would be destroyed before it even began. We look and, and we see, of course, uh, uh, all these all these things that in his time, it seems as if as if uh, as if in Absalom's time that it is it is about ready to be destroyed, or. or we see where David is able to have great power over Absalom, and then his son Solomon comes in, and then Solomon comes in, and, and it has this great potential. God gives him this great promise, and hey, if you follow me, I'll give you wisdom and all these things, but then we see where, the, as he's making promises with nations around about Israel, that, uh, that the wives are turning his heart from God to to idols, and he's making temples for, for his wives' idols and, and, and for their religions, and he's bowing himself down to them because he, uh, but uh, because he's uh, being the spiritual decline of, of Solomon, um, like First Kings chapter 11, uh, we're not going to go there, uh, but uh, you can see the, the spiritual decline of Solomon and, and his life where he had great potential, where, where at the beginning of his life, uh, uh, people come and they, they see how he's worshiping at the temple and, and uh, you see uh, the, the, the uh, visiting queen of Sheba. She's like, oh wow, look at him going up to the temple worshiping the Lord and doing all these wonderful things. And yet then at the end of his decline of his life, we see where he's not worshiping at the temple of the Lord anymore. He's worshiping idols with, uh, with pagan wives that uh, more than one and, and, and uh, multitudes of of these women and so forth from different countries and different religions turning his heart from the Lord and, and we say where is your former loving kindnesses to David I thought this thing was supposed to be established forever but then going on uh, you can see in every stage of life if you look at the pages yes you can see the great victories and you say oh look here's the hedges being built up oh look here's the here's the but then if you look closer you'll start seeing that it wasn't that way in that time Yes, they had the great victory, but before the great victory, and then after the great victory with the decline, there's always this cycle of, uh, of, of uh, hard things to get to there. And, and, and then after it's established, then, then evil comes along and, and plucks at it again. So we need to realize and understand that, yes, the promises are sure, and, and they're established, and we see them in the past, we see them in the future, but we need to realize that their presence looks like our present. The great victories that they had, we can have as well. But we just need to realize that the, the uncertainties are always going to be there, but his establishment is, uh, the establishment is the fact that they will happen. Just think about, uh, just think about uh, when Paul was in the great storm, the great weather, and that, uh, that he knew, even in his third missionary journey, that he had to get to Rome. He would be in Rome by the Spirit. He was told he was going to be in Rome. And yet... He goes to Jerusalem. Uh, he goes through all Achaia. He preaches the gospel, and, and and then he leaves there, and he goes down to Jerusalem. And then Jerusalem, they reject his witness. Uh, they they refuse his witness. They try to kill him, and yet God says, "Hey, don't worry. I'm going to be with you." Uh, and he goes to Rome. He he preaches to Nero. Nero rejects him. He eventually kills a lot of Christians. Where where's the great victory? And yet we see throughout that whole situation in Paul's life that God gave him a promise and he protected them even through the storms where it seemed like I may not survive. This, this raft, this uh, piece of wood that I'm hanging on to could sink into the sea. It could, the tides could take me out to the ocean. Uh, the, the Maltese people could, uh, could try to kill me. Uh, they, they, they may not be happy with me. Uh, I, if I go into maybe uh, the, the leader's household and, and pray for the guy who's sick, his father who's sick, and that fa father dies, he could get mad at me and try to kill me. I could try to go onto uh, the, the boat to Rome, and it could sink again and have more problems, because it's still, uh, and, and yet, because God has a promise, he was protected through it all, all of it, and, and he was able to send an angel at one time, and even himself at another time, to assure him, hey, the promises are still there for you. What we need to realize the same way in our life, just in Psalm 3, is that it feels like, where are these promises for me? They're there for you, even if you can't see them. Uh, the promises are sure, even if you don't feel like it at the time. 
All that pass by him spoil him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. Just think about this. All that pass by his way spoil him. Here, here's Paul with this great promise, and yet people are trying to beat him up, almost about ready to kill him in the temple, and yet he's rescued. Here, here's people standing by the way uh, as he goes to the priest, all about ready to kill him, but he's rescued. So we need to understand that, yes, in life situations, there will be things that happen to us. We may get beaten up. We may get killed. Uh, we may Things may happen to us, but yet the promises continue on. Uh, even if we die, we'll be resurrected and we'll receive those promises. In verse 42, Thou hast set up thy right hand, the right hand of his adversaries. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. You now David was promised that he would put his right hand in the... Um, in verse 25, I'll set his hand also on the sea and his right hand in the rivers. In other words, he had great power everywhere. And yet in 42, thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. The, you think of the right hand of, of the devil's adversaries uh, is, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the basically the, the murders and the martyrdom that had happened throughout history uh, and the, uh, the religions and the cults that have corrupted God's word uh, throughout history that have been built up, and it feels like, hey, if all these people are opposing Christ, why are they being built up? Why, why are they receiving power? Thou has made all his enemies to rejoice. The Muslim people, when, when, uh, when uh, the, the towers were destroyed, they were rejoicing, they were dancing in the streets, they, they, they pr praised Allah for, for destroying the great wicked Satan, and, and so forth, and, and, and destroying this false Christianity, and and all these things, and, and they're rejoicing in the streets. In fact, the enemies of the Lord oftentimes rejoice, and we see the rejoicing, we see the great power that they seem to have. Thou hast turned the edge of the sword, thou hast made, has not made him to stand in the battle. We, we see where great Christians standing for the faith have fallen for the faith. We see, we see people that are martyred and killed all the day long. We are killed all the day long as sheep led to the slaughter. Uh, the patches, passages say, the previous chapters we've seen, uh, where that, uh, that even in Jerusalem at the end times, it's almost like that light of, of God is, is not great empire that, of Christianity that we're going to hand over to the Lord when He returns, but rather all the Christians of God and this one bastion of the temple is the only light left on the earth and the Antichrist comes in and sets himself in this last bastion of light of God and, and, and then kills and destroys and maims the servants of the Lord in Jerusalem, and, and the bodies are piling up in the streets. And we're asking, why, Lord? What, what's going on here? It says, Thou hast made his glory to cease, and cast his throne down to the ground. There is no more David's kingdom throne here on this earth. There is no more uh, seat of power for the Lord, it appears. Uh, thou, in the days of his youth hast thou shortened, thou hast covered him with shame. You know, we've borne the shame of Christ. We, we, we are, people today, even in America, feel shame for calling themselves Christians or standing up for the truth. Uh, the, it, it seems like a shameful thing. You, you oftentimes think, oh, well, if I was in that time period of history, I could stand up and proudly say, oh, yes, I'm a Christian, and look at all the kings that stand up and say, oh, they're Christian nations and all these things. And, and we could proudly stand up without shame and boldly proclaim the name of Christ. And we get this idyllic view of the past, which was never there. The days of his youth had so shortened us, covered him with shame. Salah, he wants you to think about this. This is the way we feel. This is the way we think. Uh, and, and, and yes, the promises are still there. The surety is still there. One third of this book is about how we feel, but the other two, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, one fourth of this is about, about how we feel, but the two other uh, three fourths of this book is about the promises, the surety of them, and, and yet we, even in spite of all that, we are like, what about us here to the Lord? Uh, verse 46, how long, Lord? So the question is not, why aren't we getting them? It's like, how long will this situation, this apparent appearance last? Because we need to realize that while this is an appearance, that it feels this way. It is not the way it actually is. The, the physical, uh, you see, in fact, the, the same picture with, with David, it, I mean, with not David, but with Christ, uh, uh, is, is that in Second Ch John, uh, John chapter 2, verse 19, is that question, is that picture, 
uh, is, is that Dave, uh, Christ has a body. And yet in John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, and 18, it says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? Just answer and said unto him, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Uh, destroy, and then raise up. See, that's how the Lord works. It seems almost as if we're destroyed, yet he raises up. And he's destroyed, but yet he raises up. And that's included in, in Christ's body. And verse 20, uh, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? See, we, we look at the past and say, Oh, it took this long to get to this greatness, and then it's all wiped away in an instant. And, and yet Christ is talking about the spiritual uh, and, and raising up the body spiritually, but yet they're talking about the physical. They're seeing with the physical eyes. When we look with the physical eyes, we'll have an understanding of physicality. We'll have an understanding of the feet, of the flesh, the corruption of the flesh, causes the destruction of the flesh, causes us to feel these things. But yet if we look at the spiritual eyes, we'll see it being built up in the very heavens. We'll see things that are being built. And so that's the, that's the conflict. The conflict is how we feel in the flesh and what is actually true in the spirit. Because we every while we feel defeat in the flesh and shame in the flesh, it's actually great victory even as we feel the defeat. But he spake of the temple of his body. Uh, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So we need to... Uh, we need to realize that we need to believe the Scripture. We, we need to have an assurance in the Scripture. We need to look with spiritual eyes rather than feeling what we feel. And so we need to think about that. We need to think about the fact that 3,000 years ago there was the same guy who felt the same way that we do, and yet he had, and yet spiritually there's greater victories. Uh, we've had the, the, they had the promise of the coming of the Christ. We have the coming of the Christ. Uh, and, and so forth. And we, we, they have the promise of the Spirit being poured out upon them. We have the Spirit being poured out upon us. And, and in fact, they have those... So if we look in the Spirit, we can see them still being built up. There's not a remnant. It is actually a great, uh, a great city. So the question is not what gives. The question is not how come the conflict, but rather how long. Now, we as Christians, looking through understanding, we've got to ask, how long will this apparent contradiction appear? And, and that's the true question, is that uh, how can we, knowing the promise of the Lord, knowing where we're going, knowing where we've been, how long will it appear in our own present life shameful? How long will it appear as if we have no uh, greatness? How long will it appear as if the, the kingdom of God is not apparent? And so that's the question. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Are you hiding? Yeah, Christ is there. The Lord is there, but it's as if he's hidden. He's in the background. He's working things behind the scenes. And that's the way the Lord always works, is that here we are looking with physical eyes. We can't see the Lord. We can't see those things. It feels as if he's not here, and yet he's, he's off at work, working in the very heavens. He, he's out preparing a place for us. He's out doing these things. He's fulfilling the promises. And so we've got to ask, just like that little boy waiting for, the, uh, waiting for his dad to come home with, uh, to, with the promise of taking him out to the, get ice cream, how long? See, that little boy knows that his father's coming. Even though at the present moment he has no ice cream, at the present moment he has no uh, ability uh, to, to see what lies ahead and the bully next door is beating him up and, and, uh, and taking his toys and, and yet he says, just you wait, you know. Uh, my daddy's stronger than you. He's going to come and protect me. And yet, at that present moment, while dad's gone away, preparing a place, preparing uh, 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 his place for that little child. See, that the question is not to that little child is not, I don't really have a father. I, I don't really have these promises. I don't really have these things. Uh, no, the, the, the question to him is how long? How long will it be until I get those promises? How long will it be until I don't have to endure these situations, these problems, the, the, the bully next door? How long will it be until I can receive the glory and, and the greatness and the joy with my Father? Wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? When, that, when the dad gets home and finds out the neighbor's kid has been beating him up, you know, dad's going to be a little mad at that neighbor's kid, right? 
You know, that, that's the way it is. It's, but, but yet he's building, preparing a place for us, and therefore it appears that, that we have no power. But yet we have all the blessings it is to being the Father's child. Remember how short my time is. He says, how long? And then remember how short my time is. So I got these promises, and I can see the, the extent of the whole future, uh, and the, the extent of time, and the promises, and what you're building up. But I want to know how long, and I just want you to remember how short my time is. Uh, I'm not here physically for very long. I want to experience some of these things. I, I want to be here for this. You know, uh, we don't want... Uh, when we have the promises, we want it to be within that day. We don't want to say, have the dad promise us these things and then not and then they go off on a week long trip. We we want it we want it that day of the promise, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, you know, depending on the nature of our father's job, it'll either be that day, get home in the evening and, and go out after dinner uh, for the ice cream, or it will be when I get home from my week long trip, or even if like for some soldiers. Uh, families, the, the dad uh, is going to be gone for nine months out of the year, and, and then it comes back for uh, to take care of them. You know, so even though father is far away fighting on behalf of his country, fighting and taking care of his children from a long distance, and, and bringing home and, and sending home the paycheck and sending home uh, the blessings of his work, it's long in coming. And, you know, so depend, and we need to remember, in our mind, we, we ask how long, we need to remember God is not just away for a day, or, or building this place up for a day, or building this place up for a week or nine months out of the year, but rather that he's building it up from eternity past to eternity future. He's building it up from the promises of, of the Savior in, in, uh, in Genesis 3.15, all the way to the, uh, the execution thereof of, of, the, of uh, the New Jerusalem coming down and, and Christ and God being with us in, in Revelation 21, 19, and so forth. And, and, and we need to realize that he, he's building up to something that is great and wonderful, but yet he has to hide himself for it. He has to uh, work behind the scenes. He cannot appear before us because we are corrupt flesh, and he is a holy God, and if he appears before us now, his eternal fires will consume us, but rather he needs to build up a spirit within us. He needs to build up a glorified body for, for us so that we can stand before him, before the, him in the heavenlies. Remember how short my time is, wherefore hast thou made men in vain? You know, why are we living and die, uh, living our life and then dying and, and getting born and dying, and this process is over and over and over, why, why have you made our lives so short and yet your promises so long? We want to have the, the, the blessings quickly. You know, one of the people, even though the rapture may or may not happen in our lifetime, and, and, but we always daily hope, seek for that blessed hope. You know, to, that uh, the imminency of the rapture or, or the, the time frame or whatever it is, we're always looking towards what? That we'll be, even though that everybody before us has, has died and, and been with the Lord through death, we're always hoping, every, every single person is always hoping for what? The rapture. You know, remember how short my time is. I want to be in the rapture. I don't want to go through the death. I want to go through the rapture. You know, that's how, that's how it is. Even, even people who believe that will go through the tribulation, what do they want? Endure to the end, right? <laughs> they, they, they want to, they want to uh, receive the rapture. They want to receive the glorified body without dying. And, and so here in this passage, Ethan... He slept with the fishes, if you will. He, 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 he died, but yet he knows he's going to be resurrected one more. They looked towards the resurrection. Uh, they didn't have the promise of the imminency of the rapture or anything like that, or, or the coming of Christ. They, they had the promise of, of David and, and the promises that would one day be filled for them. But he asked the question, how long? And then, and then remember how short my time is. Not how short the kingdom is, or how short your promises are, but rather how short my time is. You know, we want the rapture to come now so that we don't have to endure the things that will come. You know, and, and so, he says, remember how short my time is, wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? You know, you give this promise that we will be raptured, but why did you make us in vain if we're just all going to die? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Uh, see, he's even seeking to live and not see death. Uh, shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? It's a lot. Think about this. He, he's saying, we can't have these promises without you. 
Remember the strength of God's ability to, uh, God's ability to fulfill His promises? He's asking that, hey, no man can live without you, without this promise. So this promise of mercy being built up in the heavens, if you don't give it to us, if you don't have it there for us, and of course we always have this question in the back of our mind, is the promise there for me? And that's what he's asking here. Shall he deliver his soul from death? I can't do it on my own. I can't save myself. I need your help to come. Remember how short my life is. Give me those promises because I can't have them. Remember, Christ said that he, being a prophet, desired to have these things, didn't get them, but we had them. And, and they without us would not be delivered, uh, and so forth. So, Lord, where are thy former loving kindnesses, which thou swearest unto David in thy truth? See, we're asking how long. We're asking, what about us? And we're also asking, as we're waiting, where's those loving kindnesses? Can you give us, in our lifetime, those promises? Well, we, we know they're there for us. We know they're in the background. But we want them for us, the, the former loving kindnesses, which thou swearest unto David in thy truth. You see, he, he doesn't, Ethan doesn't desire them just for David. He desires them for him. And so this is where we need to understand that people that say in their, in their dispensational theology that, oh yeah, David had his own little dispensation of mercy where everybody else had to work it through the, through the uh, like there's this idea that, that it was by faith and the sacrifices, where David had this promise of a, an eternal covenant, but everybody else had to work it through the sacrifices. No, that's not true. You see, Ethan desired these former loving kindnesses, which is called the sure mercies of David. He desired them for himself. He says, where are your promises? How long, Lord? Where are your former loving kindnesses, which thou swearest unto David? Remember, Lord, and the reproach of thy servants. So not only do we ask how long, not only do we desire for those promises for ourselves, we also desire to have that power that God has promised David, that God has promised those that are on Christ for ourselves. And so when we see that the world around us seems to be destroying Christianity, and, and, and Christianity is a shameful thing rather than uh, a boastful thing, uh, and we seem to see the power and the, and the crown of his, of his throne cast down and so forth, we need to ask, where are those former love and kindnesses? Can I work in those? See, those people of, of uh, Hebrews 11, saw and asunder and, and everything, and those martyrs throughout history, that... They desired to have these things, and we desire to have these things, and, and we want to work through them. And, and the great victories that we see in the past and that we'll see in the future are worked through this fact is that, is that even though we see a shamefulness, and physically, with the physical eye, we see defeat, we need to realize that with the Spirit, we can have great power. So he's calling upon the Lord to give him those, those promises, calling upon the Lord to give him the short mercies, to give him the loving kindnesses, that covenant mercy of the Lord, so that he can work through those things for the Lord. He says, give them to me, where are their former loving kindnesses? So we need to have that prayer as well. Where are your former loving kindnesses? Uh, you need to grasp a hold. When you pray to the Lord, you need to grasp a hold of the promises and say, Lord, give me those promises. I don't know how long it will be until you come back, but give me those promises so that I can work in them and as I'm working in my life, that, that short life you've given to me to, to help with you, uh, to work in the Spirit, I want you, Lord, to remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servants, how they're attacking us, and how I do bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people. You see, we have this reproach upon us, and we desire to have the loving kindnesses, but we bear in our heart the reproach and become weak. Just like Paul bore, in his re bore that reproach on himself, and thorns in the flesh, and yet he was able to receive the loving kindness of Jesus when he came and said, don't worry, Paul, uh, the promises are still there for you. Don't worry, Paul, I'm going to be protecting you. Sending an angel through the storm and say, don't worry, I'm going to be there for you. See, we need to call out and in prayer, ask for those loving kindnesses, ask for those promises to be for ourselves, and to remember our reproach. Remember that these burdens are upon us. No, they don't cause us to, to doubt or to lose faith necessarily, but the reproach of the people upon us causes us to be disheartened, to, to lose the joy. Uh, and yet, so he's calling upon him to remember the reproach that is upon himself and how he bears his feet and think, and the, the wicked seeming more mighty than us to uh, calling on the Lord to remember these things. And he says, Wherewith thine enemies have reproached. 
Remember how they're reproaching me, Lord. Give me those loving kindnesses so I can withstand them, so I can endure the challenge, to endure in faith. O Lord, wherewith have they reproached the footsteps of thine anointing? You see, even in, the, in, in Revelation, uh, thousands of years later, we have, we have the question, we have the, 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 the question in uh, Revelation chapter 6, uh, with the people under the throne, and he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They were holding that, they were holding the, the reproach, they were holding those things, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood to them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, and every one of them, and was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, till their fellow servants, also their brethren, should be killed, as they should, uh, were, should be fulfilled. So here they are physically, they're killed, they're tormented, they're destroyed, they're killed all the day long, led sheep into the slaughter, and yet they're part of that fulfilling plan of the Lord. And so we need to realize that what happens in the flesh is oftentimes not what happened in the spirit. Wherewith thine enemies have reproached the Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointing, you just remember that everything that is done by the wicked is being taken into account of. It's being checked upon. It's, it's Yes, uh, God is building this thing up for you. The promises are sure. And, and you need to call for his loving kindness to help you to endure the present situation. You know, maybe uh, that little boy, uh, when he gets beat up by his dad, uh, by, by the neighbor's kid, uh, can call on the phone and talk to his dad a little bit, you know, and get those assurances, get those promises. I'll be there at this time. Uh, I hear what's happening. Uh, I'll call up uh, the the. the the bully's dad, and, and see if I can do things from a long distance, see, see if I can help you out there, uh, and, and do those things so that when I come home, that you'll be okay, and so you see, you need to call upon the Lord for those short mercies, to help those things, and, and let him know what's going on in your personal life, because he cares, even though he is working in a long time span, he cares about the individual, he cares that, that you seek those promises for yourself in your short time period, and everybody, he gets recompense at the end. And so this ends with the, uh, the desire uh, to, to remember the reproaches of the, those, uh, of the footsteps of thine anointed. Remember how the Lord's guiding his anointed. Uh, where, wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. And so just remember, Lord, where they persecuted you, where your promises were, and how they tried to oppose your promises against me. Remember what they're doing. And so we need to remember that God is remembering these things. He's, uh, they're crying out, even all, to, all the way to the end of time, and he says, I, I got the promises for you, I'm ready, but there's something I have to do first. There's some process, there's a few more seals, there's a few more trumpets, there's a few more vials that I have to pour out on the earth, and then you'll be ready. Then, when everybody's gathered together at the great marriage supper of the Lamb, I will have all these promises for you, I will have everything prepared, and it will be all done complete, and then that... That visual that seems like everything's torn down, that, that physical will, will become one with the spiritual, and the promises will be fulfilled, and you'll be glorified, and you'll be uh, risen out of that shame. So it ends with the, the question, how long, where the loving kindness is, remember the reproaches, and then it ends with this, this enduring promise and this enduring thing that, that we in our present moment... And the end, of course, the, this verse is a subscript of, of book three, uh, the conclusion that as we're living our life, we need to live it with the attitude and with the understanding uh, and the thought, blessed be the Lord forevermore. So we understand that our present time is difficult, but that the promises are coming. And the Lord that gives those promises is blessed. He will take care of us. He will make sure that those promises are fulfilled in our life. Uh, if he has given us a promise, he will make sure that they're completed. If somebody tries to oppose those promises, he'll remember it. And as we go through it, we, we have, just as, as Job went through his trials, uh, we say, blessed is the Lord forevermore. Uh, and, and then it says, amen and amen. It's similar to where uh, the end of the book, uh, Revelation chapter 22 there, says, Remembering the reproach of those that reproach him, I testify every man that heareth the words of this prophecy, this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. He's going to remember the reproaches. And if any man shall take away the word of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. You know, those people that don't believe in the promises, 
They take away, oh, God didn't promise that. He didn't promise this. You don't get this promise. You don't get that promise. You know, there's two types of people. Those people where the promises are that they try to add to that, to, to, uh, to say, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to stop this. You know, God promised that, but I'm not going to let him do it. And then the other people say, well, you know, those promises are not really for me. Those promises aren't really for that. They're trying to take away what God promised. Other people are trying to add to there as it as trying to oppose it. And so the people that oppose will be destroyed. The people that doubt and have no faith will be destroyed. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written thereof. You don't believe in the promises, you won't get them. If you, if you oppose the promises, you will be destroyed. And he which testified of these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So we see the Lord is blessed forevermore. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be with us forevermore. Even as we are enduring this present shame, and enduring these present circumstances, uh, in our faith, even though we are being led to slaughter, uh, and even though that the body of Christ was cast down into the ground, even though the body of Christ was destroyed, it was raised up in great glory. You, you, you cast him down, he'll raise himself up in great glory. Uh, that's the promise of the Lord. Even at the very end, where, where the light is almost snuffed out, he will come in great glory uh, to restore his uh, plan. And, and what he's building up for us spiritually, we oftentimes cannot see in the physical but it's there for us, and we need to say, those promises are mine. I will not oppose them. I will do all things for them. I will ask, Lord, how long? I will ask, are they for me? Will you give me those loving kindnesses as I endure through the faith uh, for the testimony of the Lord? Uh, and, Lord, remember those who oppose you. And as I'm going through everything, I will always in my mind and always in my prayers say, blessed be the Lord forevermore. He will give me the promises that I seek. He will give me the promises that He has promised. He will build upon me a house. He will endure it forever. Uh, that faith that I have, He will keep it safe for me forever. The, the loving kindnesses of David, they are for me forever. I will hold on to them. I will be faithful to them. And I will bless the name of the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for the blessing here. I thank you for the opportunity to consider uh, your word here, Lord, I pray that you'll help us understand and, and realize that, yes, you're working in the background, you're giving us those promises, even though uh, the present time seems as if it, uh, that they are not being fulfilled, the present time seems uh, uncertain, but Lord, you're standing there with your angel, uh, you're giving us the promises, you say, hey, they're there for me, uh, we've read the back of the book uh, where it says that, uh, that if you oppose them, you'll be destroyed, if you take away from them, uh, lose, not have faith in them, you'll be destroyed, but Lord... We have faith in them. We are not those that fall back, but we, but we go on into glory. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to have faith and, and to continue through all situations to bless your name forevermore. Just not pray. Amen.